Jacob Islib. I'm the resource soil scientist with uh, Connecticut NRCS. And uh, some of you probably have, have uh, been on some of the previous workshops and seen us on here. I'm joined today by Debbie Surabian, who I think we have on video there. Yep, we got Debbie and Lisa Crawl. And uh, both, both soil scientists and they're, they're going to be um, helping us with our virtual soil texturing workshop. So um, this is the, the fifth and final soils workshop in our series this year. And this one's titled Virtual Soil Texturing in Redoxomorphic Features. So up here shared, I, I have the agenda that we're gonna follow today. So we're gonna start with a video that focuses on redoxomorphic features in soils and it's uh, taken at a field site in uh, East Windsor, Connecticut. And then we're gonna have a little live presentation about redoxomorphic features because one of the samples that we provided to you uh, has redoxomorphic features in the sample. So we'll, we'll take a stop and go live and take a look at those. And then we're gonna get into the soil texture and texturing part of the workshop. So I'll go ahead and get started with this um, redoxomorphic features. So I'm gonna stop sharing that and do a new share here. Hold on one second, let me get it going. Sorry, I've got my station set up here to texture soil, so I'm, I had to rearrange my office a little bit. Um, okay, I've got that shared, and now we can do this. Here we are on the Glacial Lake Hitchcock. Um, this is an old glacial lake uh, 15 to 20,000 years ago. Uh, I would have been underwater where I'm standing right now. Um, these are some of the most uh, finest textured soils we have. Uh, they are typically a silty clay loam or a silty clay. And you can see I can make a, a substantial ribbon out of that. Uh, you know, th this whole area was utilized for uh, brick making. Uh, so they, these clay soils are, are sought after for uh, you know, the raw materials for making bricks. Uh, they make uh, pottery out of them. Um, and very, very fine textured uh, soils that, as you can see, perch a water table. So we have a lot of uh, wetland plants or what we call hydrophytic plants here. We have cattails, we have sedges and rushes uh, that thrive in these wetland soils. Um, very, very slowly permeable soil, so water perches on top of them whenever you're in these uh, shallow concave areas. Uh, and you'll have this, these wetlands uh, developing in these soils. Um, very difficult uh, for, for many uh, uses like farming or residential development, uh, you know, just due to the, the high water table and the low permeabilities and the, the, a lot of frost action associated with these uh, soils here. We're down here at our glacial lake bed site and um, the soils here give us a good opportunity to share with you process and soils. Um, that they undergo when they are, are very saturated, very wet soils, and that is iron movement. And this is one of the features that, that we use to identify uh, hydric soils that are used in wetland uh, identification and delineation. And, uh, and they're a very reliable feature in, in soil. Their process of formation is that under uh, saturation for long enough periods of time, typically it needs to be um, at least you know three plus weeks during the, the growing season um, the iron will be reduced and so these these 
brown uh, colors that we see on the surface of the soil here are actually iron oxides that are bound to the soil material. And uh, when that iron material is reduced under saturated and reduced conditions, uh, it goes into solution, it becomes colorless, and it's able to uh, be mobile within the soil, soil matrix. And then when it dries out again, um, because we have wetter and drier times of year, when it dries out again, that iron actually precipitates back into its, its more stable form where it's immobile and it has that color. And, that, and what we're left with here are these gray zones are where the iron has been stripped off the surface of the soil. So that's kind of the naked soil. And then these brown and reddish areas that we see here are areas where the iron has sort of been concentrated or precipitated. And we refer to those as iron concentrations. And all these features collectively, and there's, there's a lot of different types of iron features that we would identify in these in, uh, in soils. Um, they're referred to as redoxomorphic features um, for reduction oxidation reactions. Standing example of uh, oxidized uh, root channels, as you can see, uh, right around this area where the root had gone through, you can see this narrow band of very red oxidized iron. So the root that was in this channel was pumping oxygen into the soil and changing the, um, the ferrous iron or the reduced iron, the Fe2 plus iron, into Fe3 plus iron, the ferric state of iron. Um, once it's oxidized, it turns red and becomes fairly immobile. And you can see that, you know, in this saturated soil, the, these plants that are adapted to grow in these wetlands are pumping oxygen down into the soil, enabling them to better thrive. And you can see this uh, juncus or this rush uh, right here is probably the one of the plants that, that it has that capability to produce those oxidized uh, root channels. And you, they're also uh, referred to sometimes as oxidized rhizospheres. But very, very good example of, of oxidation in soils and particularly in wetland soils or you'll see it referred to as a hydric soil. Okay. Stop that share. <laughs> and at this point, I, I want to, we'll break from the videos now that we kind of have a little idea of what a redoxomorphic feature is. And I want folks to look in their trusty soil kits that we distributed. The first step with these kits is to take out your you got to get your uh, your sticker. You got to put your sticker on, and then I want you to take out sample two, which sample two was actually taken from the site that Donald was presenting from in that video. That's in East Windsor, Connecticut, um, down in kind of a low lying area. That would have been a, a glacial lake if you were here during the last glacial period. And the samples that we took from there, let's see if I can get, get one. So here we have baggy soil sample, labeled soil sample two. And if we take out, you know, there's you know, some of these have gotten kind of probably broken up maybe in shipment, but a lot of them, these are higher clay soils. So hopefully these soil aggregates survived being distributed and you can find, you know, a fair size one. Here's, here's one of my my hand and then if you break it in half, break it a little bit, you can start to see some of these colors. I'm not sure how well this is gonna show up with my lighting here. But when you look at that, you should be able to see that there's some areas that are very light colored, very gray in appearance. And then there's some other areas that have sort of a rust colored appearance. So it's going to be like an orangey red type. And these are redoxomorphic features. And some of the redoxomorphic features where we have the iron concentrated, as was described in the videos, we refer to those as iron concentrations or, or masses of oxidized iron. 
And then the very gray, the grayest, the lightest colored areas are iron depletions. And both of those are kind of specific types of redoxomorphic features. And again, redoxomorphic features is referring to the fact that um, what, what happens with the iron and manganese in soils that, that causes these different colors that we see are, are uh, reduction oxidation reactions. And we know from chemistry that reduction oxidation reactions are just changes in the oxidation state of, of these. And, and so, and what's going on with the iron, like Donald had described in the video, is that when iron is reduced, that Fe2 plus, uh, it goes colorless and it's mobile within the soil water. And then when it's oxidized, it's, it's Fe3 plus, and that is that immobile, uh, you know, rust colored iron that we associate with these uh, the iron concentration features. So I wish we could be showing you this in a soil pit in the field, but this is about <laughs> as best that we can do. Is that now, is anybody seeing those in their samples? Just break apart your samples if you've got some decent sized. Yeah. Awesome. You can see some. Okay, cool. So, and we will be using this uh, sample also for texture later. So if you want to set aside, if you find one with some nice redox on it and you want to save that, I think everybody should have enough sample. You should have plenty to be able to texture it. You can save some of these for, for looking at, at redox. So. Those are, are uh, redox features. Does anybody that's on the, the workshop at this point have any questions about redoxomorphic features that we can answer at this point? Feel free to either put them in the chat or if you want to go off mute. We don't really have like a lot of people on here, so it's probably fine to go off mute if you'd rather. I guess hearing none, we can move on. If anything uh, comes up later and you want to put it in the chat, we can always circle back and answer any questions uh, after the next video or something. So at this point in our workshop today, I want to go to our, our next uh, video that we have. And the next one up is titled Soil Texture and Particle Size Analysis by Hydrometer. And this was a video that we made with Don Petinelli at the Yukon Soil Nutrient Analysis Lab. And some of you may have met Don at the previous in-person workshops. If, you, you know, if you've been doing this for a few years or, or some of the, um, the advisors may, may remember Don. And, uh, but we have a video of, of Dawn kind of giving a similar presentation as what she would have done at our in-person workshop. So without further ado, I'm gonna get set up here and we will get Dawn on. My name is Dawn Patinelli. I'm a soil scientist. I work at the University of Connecticut. I run the University of Connecticut Soil Testing Lab. And what we do here is we analyze soils from both farmers and from homeowners for um, soil fertility. So we tell farmers and gardeners how much they need to add in terms of limestone and fertilizer. And we also do research samples. So welcome to the Natural Resource Conservation Academy. I'm really glad that you're able to partake of this. I wish I could do this in person with you, but um, we're going to be doing this virtually. So I'm so glad that you've learned about a lot of things of soils before we've actually started talking today. Um, some of the stuff you've learned probably makes you realize that the soil is really a dynamic living system. It has different properties. It has chemical properties and physical properties and biological properties. And we're going to talk about one of the physical properties here today. So a physical property would be something that you could see or something that you could touch. 
So for instance, you learned about soil colors, and there's all these wonderful soil colors that you can see. And the soil colors represent maybe the mineralogy, the different types of reactions that occur in the soil, and how much organic matter is in it. So we're going to discuss another soil property today, and hopefully you'll be able to follow along with me and have the opportunity to also texture soils. So we're going to talk about soil texture, and what soil texture is, is actually the proportion of sand, silt, and clay in a soil. Soil texture is actually a key property because if you know the soil texture, you'll know a lot about the soil's properties. For instance, you'll know how porous the soil is. If you have a soil that has more sand in it, it's going to be able to, um, water's going to be able to infiltrate it, water's going to be able to percolate down, maybe recharge the groundwater table. You'll also know something about how much water can um, a soil hold, depending on the soil texture. And then you'll know something a little bit about how much nutrients the soil can tell. So all of these things you can discern just by knowing what the texture of the soil is. So what is soil texture? All it is is the proportion of sand, silt, and clay in a soil. And you probably have already learned that a soil is made up of mineral matter, which is the sand, silt, and clay, organic matter, air, and water. So today we're going to look into how you can tell what the, soil, the texture of your soil is. We're fortunate right now because we're doing this um, in a lab that I can show you what would happen if you sent a soil sample to me and you wanted the soil texture um, determined at, in a laboratory. So what we do is we end up um, getting your soil, we, we put it in a little um, container and we add some water to it, we add a dispersant to it, and what this dispersant does is it causes the soil particles to not clump together, to become dispersed, to become individual. And then we stick it on our old, old milkshake machine. We do not use this for making milkshakes. And then we'll turn it on, and we'll let it go for about 10 minutes. And then after 10 minutes, we take, this, we take our, our slurry. We want to make sure that we get all of it into our little milkshake cup here. And we would pour it into what's called a boyuca cylinder. And you see I've already poured it in there. And then we need to, what we're going to do is we're going to measure how much sand, silt, and clay is in the soil. And we do this by using something called Stokes Law. I don't know how many of you have taken soil physics yet or any kind of physics class, but basically Stokes Law just says heavier particles settle fast. So we end up stirring it all up. And after we get it all stirred up, we put in our hydrometer. And this measures in grams per liter how much um, material is in here. So we'll wait, we wait, we give it a week of 40 seconds, and then we'll take a reading. So in this case, you could see it's pretty high, and the reading would be somewhere between 25 and 30. And that's how many grams of, of sand is in there. And then we wait two hours and we take another reading. We don't stir it again. We let it settle. So it's, everything's going to settle to the bottom. We take another reading. And then we do calculations to determine how much sand, silt, and clay is in your soil. So this is a soil mechanical analysis or a soil textural analysis. And this is a very simple version of how you would do it in the lab. Okay. So in that video, we wanted to show how soil texture would be measured in, in a lab. So um, as Dawn showed there, she was at the, the plant nutrient lab at, at UConn and, and kind of showed the, the, the method that she would use if she received your soil sample that you had dropped off or, or mailed into the lab um, in order to get a very precise um, measurement of the sand, silt, and clay and different soil separates that we learned about in a previous workshop and arrive at that, that soil texture. Um, and so does anybody at this point have any questions about soil texture or about the hydrometer method used in the video? I have a question to pose to everyone. So she talked about the properties of soil, chemical, physical, and biological. So which one was soil texture?
uh, physical? That's right. Yep. That's correct. Very good. I see we got some more coming in the chat there. So excellent. Yep. Physical. Yep. yep. Physical properties. And also from one of the previous workshops, we had talked somewhat about dynamic soil properties and genetic soil properties. So dynamic are kind of these unchangeable or minimally changeable through management. And um, or I'm sorry, I don't know if I said that right. The genetic soil properties are unchangeable or minimally changeable and dynamic soil properties are ones that are can be greatly affected by management. So um, again, in the chat, do you, what do you think soil texture is? Do you think it's one of these dynamic soil properties or one of these more inherent or genetic soil properties? <laughs> so we'll, we'll just offer up that it's, um, it's kind of more of our, our a genetic soil property. It's on larger scales of management. Um, so without really adding additional sand, silt, or clay, it's really not going to change that much. And that kind of uh, kind of management would be unrealistic on on large scales. On a very very small home garden, or if you were doing say like potted plants or like a potted garden, um, you could fine tune. Your, your soil mix. If you wanted to add some more sand to it or so, you know, some compost, things like that, you could, you could really greatly affect it. But when you start looking at like a larger garden to farm scale, or when we're looking at evaluating soil properties like on a watershed scale, say if you were um, you know, a, a land use manager or something looking at these very, very large uh, scales, soil texture isn't something that's that's going to change very much and an example of a dynamic soil property to to contrast is like soil st uh, structure so um if a farm a farmer's on his field his or her field and say they go out and they run large tractors over that right after a you know really really heavy rain they get right out there with that heavy equipment they're very likely going to destroy a, a lot of the soil structure that's in at least like the, the upper part of the soil in those surface horizons. Um, so they might really squish it. They're gonna lose pore space in there, kind of compact that, that surface in that wet soil, um, but they will not have really affected the sand, silt and clay amounts that are in those, those surface layers by, by doing that. They've just kind of really squished it or compacted it. So um, that's what we're talking about when we're thinking about uh, genetic soil properties or, or dynamic soil properties. So the next video that we have planned is also with Dawn Petnelli in the lab there. And as opposed to her lab measurement method using the hydrometer, she is going to show us a way that we can estimate soil texture um, using our, our hands, using our sense of feeling. So uh, cue up Dawn and let her get going here. So today, there we go. Take it away, Don. <laughs> so today we're gonna look into how you can tell what the texture of your soil is. So I have a bunch of different soils with different soil textures, and I'll show you how to do some hand texturing. But before you do the hand texturing, what you need to think about is what do these soil particles feel like? So I told you there's, we have sand, silt, and clay. These are called soil separates because they're separated by size. A sand particle would be between 2 and 0 0.05 millimeters. And you can see here, I have a chart of all, kind, all the different sands from very coarse to very fine. And even this is very, very fine, you can still see the individual grains. Sand particles feel very gritty. And if, you, if it was quiet and you took a handful of sand and you rubbed it next to your ear, you'd be able to hear it because it'd be very, very crunchy. Then we have and a sand particle, basically, if you think about it, it's like if you took a rock and you took a hammer to the rock and you smashed it into little pieces, you would end up getting sand particles. And then if you made these sand particles smaller, they would go from very coarse to coarse to medium to fine to very fine sand. 
Once they got into the very fine sand particle stage, if you took another hammer and you made them even smaller, you can make silt particles. So both silt particles and sand particles look like little tiny rocks. The silt particles, though, are so, so tiny. Um, maybe if you had a hand lens, you would be able to see the individual particles, but they feel very, very, very soft. They feel like talcum powder. They feel like baby powder. They feel like silk. They're very, very smooth. You can't feel the individual particles. With sand, you can feel the individual particles. And then we have clay particles. They're so, so tiny. You have to look at them under a microscope to be able to see them. So unlike having a, um, for a sand or a silt, you would have a particle that would be somewhat rock-shaped. For a clay particle, you would have these fine layered particles, um, which is really kind of interesting. Uh, the clay dogs that you found, I, that, you were, that you were given, are found in between some of the varv layers, and these varv layers can run dozens of feet thick. They're just really amazing. So you're going to be trying to feel coarse textured particles. You're going to be trying to feel fine textured particles that feel very soft and smooth. And you're going to be trying to feel sticky particles because clay particles are sticky. So the USDA has come up with this textural triangle. And we have a little textural, and we'll have a little guide. And you guys are going to get either this guide or a similar guide um, in your packets. And if you notice, the textural triangle has 12 classes, and each side is a different soil separate. One side is clay, one side is silt, and one side is sand. And then, um, if you notice at the points, one point is predominantly sand, one point is silt, one point is clay. So how do you know which way, before I show you how to use this chart, how do you know which way to look up your, um, the, your um, decision on how much sand, silt, and clay is? So if you see these charts, they have little lines going this way, this way, and this way. So your sand line would always come up this way. Your clay line would always go this way, and your silt line would always go down this way. So this soil, for instance, has 33% silt, so you go down to 33. See, it's 30 right here. It has 33% clay, so you go right in here, and it has 34% sand. And if you notice the category it's in, it's in a loam. And a loam is a really neat soil, and I hope that you did receive a sample of loam, because e even a loam soil feels equally sandy, or equally gritty, equally soft, and equally sticky. So to, to use this field guide, what would you do? Well, the first thing it says to do is to grab a handful of soil and, and see if it squeezes together. In this case, this is a coarse sand, and so it doesn't matter. And then it says, well, if it doesn't squeeze together, is that because it's too dry? In this case, it really isn't, because you really can't make a ball. It keeps crumbling. This is just a coarse sand with some organic matter. Actually, this is a manufactured soil, which is good for raised bed gardenings, but it might not be the, because it's so sandy, it might not be the best for growing things. Then, so this one would be a sand so does the soil hold together when squeezed? No. Is the soil too dry? No. Is the sediment too wet? No. It's a sand. So next what we're going to do is we're going to take a handful of soil, and I'm going to pick a loam here, and then we're going to make our, our little ball. Does it hold together? Yes. Do I need to add more water? No. Then what it says to do is it says to uh, make a ribbon. So what a ribbon is, is you would take it between the thumb and your forefinger, and you're squeezing the soil out, and you're seeing how far the ribbon goes before it breaks. And in this case, and if it's too wet, you're going to have difficulty, and if it's too dry, you're going to have difficulty. In this case, the ribbon is about an inch long, and then it ends up breaking. So then we go down here. Is the ribbon less than 2.5 centimeters? 2.5 centimeters is an inch. Um, and the answer is yes. So then what it says here is excessively wet a small pinch of soil in the palm and rub with your forefinger. So I'm going to take a little bit of soil and I'm going to take a little, dip it in a little bit of water and then I'm going to rub it. And since this is a loam, it feels equally gritty, equally soft, and equally sticky. So in this case, is, is the soil very sandy? No, so it wouldn't be a sandy loam. Is the soil moderately sandy? Yes, so it would be a loam. 
And if you didn't feel any grit in it, it would be a silt loam. So the silt loam, for instance, you can still make your nice ribbon. And I wish you were here to feel this, and I'm hoping you get some samples of silt loam. You still make a ribbon. It still breaks at about an inch. But if you wet it excessively, what you're going to notice is it just feels so, so, so soft. It feels just like you have baby powder or you have talcum powder in your hand. And then for clay soils, let me just put my hand real fast. So this, then I have a silty clay loam. So this one I can make a, a much longer ribbon with. So this one, if you can see, it's making a ribbon, it's making a ribbon, it's making like a little snake. You could actually, you could mold it. It's very sticky. Just a little bit of this really sticks to your hand. So in this case, since this is a, uh, this is a silty clay loam, uh, is the ribbon from 2.5 to 5 inches long before breaking? Yes. And then if I took a pinch of this, I would find out that it feels very smooth. I don't have any grit in it at all. It's just very, very, very smooth and soft. And you can make it into all kinds of things. Um, you could use it for pottery. You can make bowls out of it. You probably, I'll tell you right now in Connecticut, you're probably not going to get sandy clays or, cl or clays. They, they, they don't really occur. So most of the soils that you'll find in Connecticut, actually, I think, we do, we do something maybe like three, four hundred soil textures a year, and, and realistically, the, the most common soil textural classification is a sandy loam. And that's actually good. If you're a gardener, it's a good thing because a sandy loam has um, usually about 60% sand. It might have 20, 25% silt in it and maybe 10% clay. It's good for gardening. It's good for farming. Um, it doesn't compact that, that much. So it really is a good soil. We we'll, would we'll find these um, the silt loams and the loams usually along the, the waterways, along the river valleys, and then we'd find these coarse sandy soils, the loamy sands. You'd find those along the coast. So it, when you think about if you're going out and you, we ever get to venture past our house and explore different parts of Connecticut, or you're just taking a walk in the woods to enjoy it because you can go out there, think about where you are in Connecticut. Grab a handful of soil, moisten it a little bit, and see what you come up with. You'd be surprised at the variety of textures that you could find. And again, once you know what the soil texture is, there's a whole bunch of other things that it can tell you about the soil. All right, so Don did a great job there of introducing us to the soil texture by feel method. And at this point, we want to kind of run with that and get into using our, our kits here. So in our kits, we already got out sample two to take a look at some of the, the redox morphic features in that sample. But we'll just go ahead and kind of walk through what, what else is in here. There's a very nice bookmark of your mm -hmm. state soil, Windsor, that you can use. Um, and then we have some instruction. Oh, there's some, look, there's some, there's some temporary tattoos too. And um, so the first sheet on here is a materials you need. So we have our soil texture samples that were provided. We need a, a small bowl of water or better yet, if you have it, a little spray bottle of water. So you'll need that. You need some kind of cover for your table because soil texturing by feel can get a little messy. So what I am using here, if you can see it, is I'm just using one of these, that big gallon uh, Ziploc bag. Very, It's the same uh, type of bag that your kit came in. So you could use newspaper or an old towel or pretty much anything that you'd rather get soil on than your desk. You can use that. Um, and then paper towels or a hand towel to use. So I've got some paper towels here. You could also, like before, you could use an old towel or something just to wipe off your, your hands between samples. So getting started. Um, we also provided this handout, which is from Colorado State. And it's a nice, it's got some nice information about soil texture and it shows you some of the the relative sizes of the, the different soil separates. 
but it also has a soil texture triangle. And I'm glad that Dawn had gone over the soil textural triangle in the video because I have a very strong feeling that there are going to be some questions about textures against the soil textural triangle on the Envirothon exam. Um, there's usually a couple of those every year. So just, just a hint there of something to come. And then on the very back, we have a copy of the same uh, flow chart that Dawn was using in the video that walks us through the texture by feel starting with our samples. So that's what we're going to use. So I recommend that you have your green staple packet here and just leave this somewhere where, where it's easier, uh, easy for you to see on your desk while you're doing this and, and turn it to where you can see that, that flow chart. So let's start with soil sample one. So you can see just compared to the other one that we had before, it's a much brighter color. This soil sample two that we were looking at the redoxomorphic features, the overall color of this or the matrix color is kind of like this very sort of muted grayish color in this. And then this sample that we have, and I realize I'm kind of backlit, so I don't know if I can change my camera angle so that you can see this a little bit better. Lighting is just not ideal here, but it is a very kind of bright oxidized color. I'm going to angle my camera so that we can see it. So I am going to just get out some of this material and yeah, maybe you can see it better now in my, my hand. So yeah, you can see that this is a definitely a more uniform kind of oxidized, um, slightly red, almost like a, like an orange type type colored material. And I can feel uh, in my hand, the sample that I have and see how it's it's crumbling a little bit, which you should be able to see there. So I know I'm going to need to add some some water to this to be able to to get an extra accurate uh, texture estimate uh, by feel. So starting with our flow chart up at the top where it says start it says pla place a heaping tablespoon of soil in the palm. So I've got roughly a heaping tablespoon here and add water a drop at a time and need the soil to break down all aggregates. So one thing in doing texture by feel that you, you wanna try to avoid is adding too much water. So we're trying to kind of get our sample to this ideal moisture state to, to do this, this uh, field estimate. And if you really flood your, your sample with water, you'll just end up with like a really over wet slurry. And so either using your bowl of water that you have or your trusty spray bottle I'm just going to start adding a little bit of water, just a little bit. So I'm not making it pond or anything in my palm. I'm just adding a little bit just to kind of moisten my sample. And now you can see, see why I want a table cover here because I already have some falling out of my hand. But if you start with a good amount and you start to wet it up, you're going to lose a little bit. And then you can see I'm starting to get a sample and I press that with my thumb, it's still crumbling a little bit. Just add a little bit more water. And you want something that it's not always going to feel like silly putty, like really smooth like silly putty. But you know, if you can remember what silly putty kind of feels like as far as almost like a moisture of it, you want something like that. So you don't want like a slurry, like a really, really wet slurry. And you don't want something so dry that it's just kind of crumbling apart. Um, but you want something that's, you know, that can be kind of a coherent sample, but not overly wet. So I'm just adding little bits of moisture to bring it up to that kind of ideal moisture state without over wetting it. So I think I'm, I'm pretty close here. So add water, drop at a time, knead the soil to break down all aggregates. So I've been kind of working this around. I've got it kneaded. Soil is a proper consistency when moldable like moist putty. All right, I think I'm there. Does soil remain in a ball when squeezed? All right, so let's try this. Hopefully some of you are able to do this with me here. So I'm squeezing it into like a ball and yep, I can, it holds into a ball when I squeeze it like that in my palm and I can even kind of toss it a little bit and it's definitely kind of holding shape there. So 
So how's, yeah. it, how's everybody else doing? Are they getting the ball and? Yeah, do we have our, we have some, some folks at, at home that are able to try this? I'm seeing a lot of people's cameras turned off, so. Yes, Marblewood is getting a ball. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. Answer on chat too. Great. <laughs> so, so we've got, got a ball here. So does it remain in a ball when squeezed? Yes. So then we're going to go down. We're going to move down in this flow chart here. Play, um, place a ball of soil between the thumb and forefinger and gen gently push it with the thumb, squeezing upward into a ribbon. <clears throat> Form a ribbon of uniform thickness and width. Allow the ribbon to emerge and extend over the forefinger, breaking from its own weight. All right, so let's try this. So this is where, and Don showed this in the video. Hopefully you can kind of see here. So I've got my, my sample formed into a ball and then I'm just, I'm going to work it out with my, with my thumb from my, my four fingers. So I'm kind of holding the sample in my four fingers here. And then I'm just sort of going to push it with my thumb. So I'm going to start to push it and you can see what's happening. I'll try to hold it down here so you can, as soon as I push it a little bit away from my forefinger, it's just, it's really not holding that ribbon it's just kind of crumbling if if something holds a ribbon you know it'll it'll start to extend like you know a decent amount away from your forefinger there while you're doing that so why don't you try that if you have your sample worked up and see if you kind of get the same thing with this one and out there in the audience are you are you ending up with a similar result or has anybody got like a two inch ribbon and they're like what's going on then you might have a wrong sample. <laughs> then you might be on <laughs> sample too. <laughs> Definitely want to encourage folks too. You know, if you have a garden at home and you're kind of wondering what you're gardening, and you know, maybe later on, go grab a grab a sample of it and and walk through this. It's it's a fun uh, fun thing to do. Um, especially during the pandemic when we don't have as much other fun stuff to do. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's all relative. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, so using our flow chart, does the soil form a ribbon? And I am an adventure that no, it does not form a ribbon because I really couldn't push that out very far away from my forefinger there without it breaking off. So if we say no, then we arrive right there on the left, loamy sand. So with my sample that I had, I, I'm going to estimate that this is a, a, a loamy sand texture. And um, so that's, that's that with that, with that texture. Does anybody that's doing this in our, as far as our participants on this, have any questions at this point? Or feel free to type or if your hands are too messy from texturing, you can, you can go off mute and, and ask if you'd like. In the meantime, while we're waiting for any questions to come in, I'm, I'm just gonna um, wash my hands off. So at this point, you can see from handling it, I've just got, you know, I've, I've got a little bit of material left on my, my hands. I wanna clean this off in between samples because even a little bit of material like this, especially if these are sands, we get into doing our next uh, sample that can kind of, um, it'll throw you off, you know, if you, if you or start a new sample and you already got sand on your hand or something. So I'm gonna go ahead and wash my hands. So, cause I'm not hearing any questions coming in. I'm hoping that everybody's kind of seeing the same thing that I was seeing with that, that loamy sand uh, sample. And um, so this sample, uh, Lisa and I got this from it's actually right near the same site that uh, Donald and I were standing at in that first video on redoxomorphic features in, in East Windsor. Um, there's large open space area and down in the lower lying areas, they have a lot of those higher clay glacial lacustrine soils that formed in the glacial lake bed there and a lot of wetlands down in those low areas. And, um, and then a, an interesting thing about those areas is you come a little bit higher and there's terraces, the terrace landforms very close to there that are formed in glacial fluvial materials. So we were talking about the different soil parent materials in our soil formation video. So we have glacial fluvial terraces. So these would be areas where 
a um, lot of meltwater was coming out of the, the uplands and then getting to that glacial lake bed. And then the water was slowing down and sands were starting to settle out and, um, and, and it formed these, these terrace landforms. So we had this material was taken from one of these, these terraces and you can see is how how different this is. It's really not very, very far from where we were with in, in the video where we had those really high clay soils, very gray, and we could probably, you know, throw a baseball from one one site to the other, maybe. And um, and very, very different soil properties in this material. So they're very, very close, you know, spatially or geographically, but very, very different because they were on completely different landforms and they had um, different different parent materials here. So this is a water sorted glacial fluvial material, um, also referred to as, as outwash. And um, the other material that we were at in the video was a glacial lacustrine or a glacial lake bed material. Okay, let's look at sample two. So looking in your kit, back to sample two on the baggie there. And I'm gonna go ahead and move this one out of the way. See that? Same as before, I'm just gonna get out some of this material and I'm gonna try to got some big aggregates there. And with this, this is a gonna be a Spoiler alert, higher clay sample. So it's probably gonna be easier to, to work up if I if I try to get some of these smaller aggregates that are already broken up. And, um, but before I start to wet it, I'm just gonna take, take my, uh, some of these, I'm just gonna start to break them up before adding water, just to kind of crumble it up a little bit. And in doing this, you'll, you'll probably start to feel it doesn't crumble as easily as the other sample that we had, sample one. These little aggregates are, they're really sticking together. You can see as I'm breaking them apart, it's kind of destroying them, but it's just making kind of smaller aggregates. And we can estimate from this that that's, it's very likely due to, to the clay content in this, clay and silt content, probably not organic matter. We learned that organic matter is also of, it can can uh, you know really help with increase aggregate stability and aggregation soil structure, but this isn't a very dark sample, and so if it had a lot of organic matter in it, we'd be looking you know expecting that it would be very stained dark because organic carbon is kind of our our strongest coloring agent in soil. So this doesn't appear to be a very high organic matter or organic carbon sample, um, but it definitely has strong aggregate stability in here. So now that I have it broken up about like that, same as before, I'm gonna use my, my water bottle and I'm gonna start adding little bits of, of water. Just a little bit. And as I start working that, you can see now it's kind of starting to get like a putty. And with these clay, higher clay samples, it's um, it's easy to over wet them and just make a slurry like you might use in pottery or, so definitely be a little bit conservative about adding water to, to this as you wet it up. Really work it. All right, this is starting to get pretty pretty close here, so. Now you can see as I, I went from all those little crumbled up soil aggregates, just adding a little bit of water and working the sample in my my hands here. Now I have this and it's it's really looking more like a like a putty or a moist putty as it says in our flow chart. Okay, so we're gonna start back at the top of our flow chart. Heaping tablespoon of soil in the palm, add water, a drop at a time, knead the soil to break down all the aggregates. Soil is a proper consistency when moldable, like moist putty. Got it. Does the soil remain in a ball when squeezed? Yes. Okay, moving down. Place a ball of soil between the thumb and forefinger and gently push it with thumb. 
squeezing it upward into a ribbon, form a ribbon of uniform thickness. Okay, I'm starting to do that. Now you can see the difference. Let me try to hold my hand behind it so you can let's see. All right, now you can see what's happening versus before. So I'm getting about like that. There's one ribbon. I'm gonna try to do it again. Working it between the forefinger. All right, about the same, maybe a little longer than before. Let's do one more. Is anybody else getting a good ribbon? Okay, there's the third one. Right, so I'm gonna lay these out in my my hand here. So this is what I'm getting, and this is this is kind of a, a little bit a, a tougher sample to work up initially. So if you're trying this at home and uh, it's taking you a little time, don't don't worry about it, you know. Um, just take some time. Try not to over wet it. Break break these up by by hand before you're adding water. That'll hopefully make it make it easier but um so this is what i'm arriving at and i've got a little little gauge here i'll try to turn it so it's not okay so you can see that and that one's about four centimeters you know an inch is about uh, 2.5 centimeters or 25 millimeters that's a little bit longer than an inch that one's close to 40 millimeters, four centimeters. That one's about 35. So, you know, we're getting somewhere a little bit longer than an inch ribbons in this one. Okay, so we're gonna keep that in mind. And let's go through our little chart here. I don't know if this is gonna display backwards or not when I'm looking at it, but does the swell make a weak ribbon less than one inch long before breaking? No, it was actually a little bit more than one inch. So does the swell make a medium ribbon one to two inches long before breaking? Yes, I would say so. We didn't have anything that was anywhere near two inches or, or five centimeters. So let's say yes for that middle one for medium ribbon. And we're going to move down excessively wet a small pinch of soil in the palm and rub it with a forefinger. So I'm gonna use some of this material that was already broken or already um, textured since it's already nice and, and worked up. And I'm gonna add some water to my palm there. Hopefully you can see that with the lighting. Okay. And then I'm gonna start working that just with my forefinger. And I'm just now at this point, I'm trying to make a slurry. So before, if you made a slurry, it's too much water. This, you really want to work that. And to me, that is feeling very smooth. I feel very, very little grit in that. There's a few sand grains, but primarily, it just feels like super smooth to me. All right, so let's keep that in mind as we work down our flow chart. Does the soil feel very gritty? No. Does the soil feel very smooth? I would say yes to that one. Um, so at that point, we're going to, from we say yes, silty clay loam is what I, I arrive at, at with this one. And that feels like I, I've, I've felt some silty clay loam textures before, and, and that, that feels very similar to those. So I, I'm feeling pretty good about where we arrived at with, with our flow chart here. Um, if neither grittiness nor smoothness predominate, predominated, we would go to the next, and that would be a, a clay loam estimate. But that, that to me felt very, very smooth uh, in, in the hand um, when doing that last test. So how's everybody doing out there? Does, did anybody, did they get it worked up so that they could feel that? I do want to say also that it's possible that some of this sample two, I think the sample one was very uniform. Some of sample two, it's possible that folks may have gotten um, the, the upper part of the, the soil that we took from probably had a little bit more sand in it. So it's possible that you may have a slightly different texture 
if yours had a little bit more more sand in it. So is anybody in of our participants that are on the workshop right now, were they able to, to arrive at anything? How'd you do with the ribbon? Anybody make a cup? Yeah. <laughs> How about a little elephant or something? Yeah. Point. You can answer in chat too, if you want to say yes or no, or have a question. <laughs> You know, we have a kind of a limited live participants here. I think some schools are on on break. So some of you watching this may be um, watching a recording of this, but hopefully all of this um, went, went well for you. And we really encourage you, you know, if you have a, a garden or, um, or, you know, even in your, your lawn, uh, if you want to try to estimate what kind of what kind of soil texture you have where you live? You can you can do the same test. You can use it on any any kind of soil material. Um, here using that, and at this point, does anybody have any any questions about anything that we covered today, as far as redox morphic features, soil texture, soil texture by hydrometer in the lab, or soil texture by feel? We got a shout out that it's been great. Yeah, great. Good to see. Yeah. I think it went really well. I think you did a good job today, Jacob. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Hey, sure. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, so I guess with that, that's that's really all we had in our, our program. This is our, our final um, workshop in our series. And um, I, I will say in, in closing that, you know, we've had an opportunity to, to cover a lot in by, by doing these virtual workshops and, and having five of them. And so when we go to make the exam this year, we'll probably be looking back at this content that we've shared uh, in addition to the Connecticut uh, Soils Envirothon manual that's available on the Soils webpage. And, um, and, and we'll really be looking at that to pull draw from for the questions that we include in, in our exam. So, um, we appreciate everybody's participation in these. And again, we regret that we can't see you in person at the workshop or at the live Envirothon event. We're keeping our fingers crossed that as we you know, move into next school year that, that maybe we'll be closer to some kind of normal. So um, again, thank you for uh, trying the soil texturing stuff with us and getting your desk messy. And uh, I guess Mindy, I'll turn it back to you.